Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through verse 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to talk to us today from this subject, the church doing its job. The church doing its job. It becomes me this morning to give a reading of the vital signs of Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church. As we seek to, to meld the preaching of a liberating hermeneutic born of our history as a race in this land, we must, in light of that, remain consistent with biblical orthopraxy. I invoke and invite you to look with me a moment at the condition of our society. From the violent carnage of the inner cities and suburbs of Houston to the empty consumerism of our shopping malls, from our toxic wastes to our wasted time, from our religion of entertainment to our entertainments of religion, from the substances that we abuse to the economic and political institutions that abuse us, it is glaringly apparent that pragmatism has married evangelism and has given birth to the demon seed of theological illiberalism. Democrats are unable to articulate or to demonstrate the kind of moral values that must undergird any serious movement of social transformation. Republicans still deny the reality of systemic injustice and social oppression. Their call for individual self-improvement and a return to family values while ignoring the pernicious effects of poverty, racism, and sexism is to continue blaming the victim. A scholar and social scientist, Dr. Cornell West points out who has no business running for president. The liberal structuralists and the conservative behaviorists are both right and both wrong. To speak of moral behavior apart from oppressive social realities just blames the victim. 
And to speak only about social conditions apart from moral choices is to keep treating people like victims. We must not imitate nor escalate what we repudiate. Distinguished professor of African American studies at Princeton University, Dr. Eddie Glaude Jr. said you cannot be both arsonist and firefighter. You can't set it afire and then put it out. When the children of our cities are planning their funerals rather than their futures, it is a sure sign that we have lost our way if not lost our minds. Several decades ago, Mohandas K. Gandhi warned against what he called the seven social sins. According to Gandhi, the seven social sins are politics without principle, wealth without work, commerce without morality, pleasure without conscience, education without character, science without humanity, and worship without sacrifice. There is a neo-Pentecostalism. This neo-Pentecostalism Pentecostalism gaining ground in our churches that combine worship with a secular swag. A preaching that focuses more on practical living than on theological doctrine. All of these are an apt description of the clear warning in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. The church is not a nightclub. Do not come to church with an entertainment philosophy nor a nightclub mentality. There is no step show at the church. Come on, talk back to me if you can. We cannot turn the church into some place where people feel comfortable enough to be secular and think that we are in some bar room somewhere. This is the living, breathing, active, dynamic, alive body of Christ and there's got to be something different about how we act. Come out from among them. I wish I had a Bible reader. And be separated. We are in the world but we are not of the world. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapters five through seven, Jesus is the authoritative Messiah in word. His word in the Sermon on the Mount. But in chapters eight and nine, he is the Messiah at work. Humanity is dying without Christ. And we are the ones who must go next door and around the world carrying his healing touch because they will either be gathered in the harvest of grace or they will be gathered in the judgment. And if we do not sound the alarm, the blood of the lost will be required at our hands. It is a weighty and marvelous charge that Jesus gives to the disciples of all ages. Listen to this little little story. A man fell into a pit and could not get himself out. 
a Christian scientist came along and said, you only think you're in a pit. A Pharisee came along and told him only bad people fall in a pit. A fundamentalist came along and said, you deserve to be in this pit. A charismatic came along and said, you're in a pit, but don't claim it. An optimist came along and said, things could be worse. A pessimist came along and said, oh yeah, things are going to get worse. A Methodist came by and said, we brought you some food and clothing while you're in the pit. A black Baptist came by and said, I've got a feeling everything gonna be all right. Look at that, look at that. Some of y'all have started singing that already. The man said, I almost said a bad word. Forget all of that. Go get some rope. I'm in a pit. I don't need prayer. I need rope. I'm in a pit. I don't need doctrine. I need a rope. Lily Grove, men and women are on their way to hell. And they don't need a Bible verse. They need you to roll up your sleeves. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Get out of your position as chairman of this and secretary of that and soloist of this and leader of that because God does not care how many people you lead on Sunday. How many people do you lead on Monday? Yeah. Walk with me around the table. If the church is going to do its job, the first thing we have to do is visualize. You've got to visualize. You've got to see people like Jesus sees them. Jesus does not see an alcoholic. Jesus does not see a drug addict. Jesus does not see a whoremonger. Jesus does not see a homosexual. Jesus does not see anybody hooked on uh, prescription drugs. Jesus does not see a homeless person. Jesus does not see a prostitute. Jesus does not see anybody destitute. Jesus sees a soul in need of salvation. And if we would see people like Jesus sees people, we would have pity on them because pity on them will make us move to action. You will never help somebody that you don't see. And everybody in this church this morning, everybody listening to me online, your greatest need is to be seen. See me in my struggle. See me in my heartbreak. See me in my loneliness. See me in my distressing circumstance. See me in trying to raise these children by myself. See me in my sickness. See me in my hardship. See me sitting right next to you. You don't care nothing about nobody you can't see. You see them, you just not looking at them. Because when you get to the traffic light and they're standing there begging, you put your shades on or, or you act like you're fooling with your radio. 
or like you drop something on the floor, or you just look straight ahead because you say, boy, if you get next to this car, no, Jesus sees people in their emptiness because they are sheep having no shepherd. You, you, you actually think people who are strung out on drugs want to be out there? You actually think people whose lives are messed up want to live a messed up life? They don't know any better because if they knew better, they would come to Jesus. But since they don't know any better, those of us who've already found Christ, talk back to me if you can. We are not here because we are better and they are not there because they are worse. We are here because we found Jesus before they did. Because if it were not for the grace of God, I wish I had a witness. You would be on the street right now. If it were not for the grace of God, you'd be homeless right now. God's been good to you and you ought to spread that goodness to somebody else. Yeah. There was a woman caught in the very act of adultery. And they didn't just bring her, they dragged her and threw her in front of Jesus. Last time I heard, you can't commit adultery by yourself. But that's a, that's a sermon for another Sunday. They threw that woman in front of Jesus and said, Moses said she ought to be stoned. Jesus didn't pick up his head. He just started writing on the ground. And I, I don't know, I wasn't there, but perhaps he was writing down their sin. Where they were light before last. What they were doing two months ago that they had no business doing. And the Bible says they started dropping their stones from the oldest to the youngest. And Jesus said to that woman, where are your accusers? She said, there's nobody, Lord. She said, he said, I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. He that is without sin cast the first stone. Stop looking down your sanctimonious nose at people who are less fortunate than you are. Stop looking down your Baptist nose at people who don't have what you have. You are here not because you've been so holy, not because you've kept the Lord's commandments, not because you have a large print Bible. It is of the Lord's mercy. that you are not consumed. And those mercies are new every morning. Great is the Lord's faithfulness. You have to see people because if you don't see them, you'll never do the next thing that Jesus did in this text. He saw them. He saw them. He saw them and to, and to see them you have to see them not for where they are or for who they are but for what they can become do not judge me by the heights that I've attained look at the depths from whence I've come you don't know how long it took me to get to where I am right now you don't know how many doors God had to open for me. How many prayers God had to answer for me. How many tears God had to dry for me. You know my glory. But you need to know my story. Leave folk alone when they're shouting and giving God glory. They got a reason and a right. They have a reason and a right and a responsibility because anybody kept me like God kept me 
Anybody delivered like God delivered? Anybody raised up a sick baby like God raised him up? Anybody that comforted me in my longer list like God did? I got a reason and a right and a responsibility. He saw them. Jesus saw them. You got to visualize. But then secondly, if the church is going to do its job, you have to agonize. Agonize. He had compassion on them. Because it's not enough to see them. You have to be moved with compassion. That word moved in the Greek means that Jesus was moved on the inside. He was moved in his bowels. That's what that word literally means. He was moved in his heart. His emotions were stirred. Because you can see a person and be unemotional about what you saw. But if you truly see them, it, it ought to move you to be compassionate towards them. Brothers and sisters, compassion is more than sympathy. Because you can feel sorry for somebody and go home and eat a sandwich. You can feel sorry for somebody and say, poor thing, I sure hope things get better. And go home and, and watch American Idol. But when you're moved, you can't rest until you do something about that situation. I wish I had a witness here. Today we will install officers here at Lily Grove Church and I will call them up to the front. But before I do that, I want each and every one of them to know that it is not your responsibility to count money. That's, that's not the church doing its job. We can get a machine to do that. You, you, you not impressing nobody being over the scholarship committee. Because somebody was over it before you. And somebody's going to be over it after you. Wish I had somebody to help me. You are not impressing anybody with these uniforms on or with these choir robes on or sitting in this pulpit. What God is calling us to do is to win the loss. And if you are the president of this and the chairman of that and nobody has come to Christ because of you, you are sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Uh, hopefully this will sober us. When, when they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant after David found it in the home of Obed-Edom. They were bringing it back to his rightful place in Jerusalem and they, and they put it on an ox cart when God had instructed them to carry it on poles. To put it on their shoulders and carry it on poles. They, but but they, in disobedience to the word of God, they put it on an ox cart and they were traveling with it and the oxen stumbled and the cart almost fell to the ground and Uzzah put his hand on it to keep it from falling and God killed him on the spot. The lesson for you leader, if you're not going to put your heart in it, don't put your hand on it. Because if your heart is not in what you do, let me know after church and I'll put somebody else in your place. Do you know a pretty good sign that you ought not be in leadership? Is that when you're no longer in leadership, you don't support it. As long as you over it, it's all of that. And a bag of turnip greens. 
Then somebody else get over it. I ain't fooling with that no more. He ain't making dick. He get on my nerves. They trying to run everything. Well, you tried to run it when you was over. You holding it to yourself and holding it and don't want anybody else to have any ideas and make any suggestions. You got all the sense when you over it. See how quiet you got right there? A pretty good sign that you should not be in leadership is that you can't follow leadership. Because if you cannot follow, you're not fit to lead. Because leadership is not about power, it's about sacrifice. President Joe Biden says we don't lead by the example of power but by the power of example. And when, you, when you've been given assignment and you are no longer over that assignment and you no longer support the group that supported you, that's a good sign you shouldn't have been in it in the first place. If, if, if somebody else got your solo, get in the choir and support them. I mean, you, you know, you got a good voice and, and uh, Ernest don't ever use me. We got to use who show up. You want to be used? Show up. Diva. Take up all your bangles and sparkles and get in the choir. And if you got it, somebody going to hear it. Because God gave you the gift. And if you don't use it to his glory, God will strip you of your power and take somebody whose voice sounds like gravel on the road. And use them for his glory and for his honor. When was the last time? You wept for somebody who was on their way to hell. When did you last weep for these young people who are not being raised right? Whose, whose parents are in the streets. And these children are, are trying to go to school. They're trying to learn. They're trying to do the right thing but their daddy is in prison their mama still in the club I weep for these young people I weep for that man who's in his 50s and 60s and still on drugs has no hope in Christ no direction don't know where his life is going to end up I weep for them because somebody wept for me Somebody prayed for me. I wish I had some help right here. Somebody asked God to keep me till I could learn some sense. And you are in this church this morning because some mama, some daddy, some Sunday school teacher, some, some old person in your life helped you to get to where you are. And since they help you, you ought to help somebody else. you're not in jail not because you didn't do enough to go but God had mercy on you and salvation is not just what you've been delivered from it's what God kept you from somebody ought to help me talk here God kept some of us from being everything we wanted to be and doing everything we wanted to do. We did some of it, God just restrained us and brought us back to our senses before we went all the way to being a fool. I wish I had a crook in here this morning. It was on your mind, God just didn't let you do it. You had a desire for it, but God kept you from it. That's salvation.
And then there are some of us in here, the devil that just about used you up. God got what's left, but let him use that. You gonna help me preach this, won't you? Not only must you visualize, not only must you agonize, but then finally you have to evangelize. It's not enough to see them. It's not enough to agonize over their condition. You have to go get them. Each one of us has to reach somebody. That's somebody you have influence over. I'm not talking about your immediate family now because you're really in trouble if you can't influence your immediate family. A pastor and I were talking about it the other day and he was uh, talking about uh, his, his child goes to, he passes a church and his child goes to somebody else's church. And uh, he was distraught about that and he said, Reverend, I don't know if you're going through that. I said, no. I said, well, let me put it this way. My ch- my child could go to somebody else's church, but they have to wheel her in a wheelchair. <laughs> she, she welcome to join any church she want to join. But, but she have to eat her food with a straw. B- because these people are making it possible, have made it possible, for you to be where you are and the height of ingratitude is to take what I give you and act like I didn't give it to you. And so I'm not talking about your immediate family because if you can't, if you, if you don't have any control over your own place where you live, then I, then that's, that's God bless you. But I'm talking about folk that you come in contact with in your concentric circle of concern. They ought to look at you and know that you've been to church. Your conversation, your conduct, the way you live on your street, the way you act at the supermarket, the way you act in the department store, ought to let people know that you've been with Jesus. If you got ugly ways and a nasty disposition and you say that you are the president of this or the chairman of that, or you're giving leadership to this, people will look at you like you're crazy. How you leading somebody and can't speak to people? How can you lead where you won't go? How can you teach what you don't know? Jesus went and got there. There was a man, I'm through, in the tombs cutting himself with stones. They couldn't even tame him. They tie him up, he throw the threads off, run back in town screaming like a maniac. And Jesus came that way. And Jesus said, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion. For there are many demons And Jesus healed him of that demonic spirit. And people were more afraid of him after Jesus got through with it than they were when he was in his demoniac state. Because people like to see you in the situation you're in because that makes them above you. Somebody ought to help me talk here. But when Jesus got through with them, the Bible says he put on some clothes and he was in his right mind. And brothers and sisters, when Jesus gets through with you, doesn't matter who likes you, who does not like it does not matter who's on your side who's not on your side when Jesus gets through with you it it does not matter if they let you lead something or 
If they don't even give you a part in the play, it does not matter. If they don't ever let you sit in the front, it does not matter. If you weigh in the back of the choir, it does not matter. If you never get to lead the ushers, it does not matter. If your name is never on the program, it does not matter. If you never get an opportunity to speak at the mic, if when you give the best of your service, telling the world, that the Savior has come. Be not dismayed. If men don't believe you, he'll understand and say, Well done. Misunderstood is the Savior of sinners. Hung on the cross, he was God's only son. Oh, hear him calling his Father in heaven. Not my will. But thine be done. Oh, when I come to the, the end of my journey, weary of life and the battle is won, carrying the staff and the cross of redemption, he'll understand and say, well done. When it's over, he doesn't have to call me bishop. He don't have to call me doctor. He doesn't have to call me reverend. He doesn't have to call me pastor, servant. Well done. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter now into your master's joy.